Hi everyone, welcome back to the Hockey Journey Podcast, episode number 78, How to Build an Elite Hockey Player, presented to you by OnlineHockeyTraining.com. I'm your host, Coach Lance Pedler. If you're new here, please make sure you subscribe so you won't miss out on any future episodes. Before we strap on the work belt, start building us a hockey player and begin this conversation. If you want to learn more about me, my hockey experiences, then I have the world's largest database of off-ice stick handling, passing, and hockey shooting drills, what I know, and most importantly, how I've been helping hockey players get really good with a stick and puck, just head on over to OnlineHockeyTraining.com, that's OnlineHockeyTraining.com, and gain instant access to my 10-part video series where I'll show you everything. Consider it my gift to you. Lastly, if you live in Minnesota or are visiting the state of hockey sometime soon, and you want to schedule an in-person, off-ice stick skills lesson, I'd love to have the opportunity to show you my little world. Go to SweetHockeyCoach.com, that's SweetHockeyCoach.com, and watch the video on the homepage for instructions. Thanks, and I look forward to working with you sometime soon. Have you ever wondered if there's a blueprint out there somewhere for how to build an elite hockey player? I know when my boys first got interested in the sport, I sure wish there was something available to help guide me through those early years of being a parent of a couple hockey players and coaching a bunch of others as well. Even though I played Division I hockey and had a 12-year professional career, when I stepped on the ice for the first time with a group of five-year-olds who most had never been on skates before, I was a little scared, intimidated, and overwhelmed as I had no idea how to proceed not only for that practice but any others as well in the near future. Lucky for me, I had some amazing head coaches that really showed me the way, creating a solid foundation, which turned out to be a 17-year youth hockey coaching career. What once was a complete mystery to me close to two decades ago has now become pretty clear, and I think now I have gained the knowledge to give some solid advice to parents who are about to set off on their hockey journey or are early into it. I always like to enhance the experience, but more importantly, I want to jack up the credibility of this show. So I've invited my good friend and skating technician, Barry Karn, back to the show. If you remember from episode number 12, Mr. Barry Karn is regarded as one of the top skating instructors in the world. Barry and his wife, Jody Karn, have been teaching skating since 1984. Barry worked as an NHL skating coach for 22 years with Arizona, Calgary, St. Louis, Minnesota, San Jose, and Tampa. There are over 200 current NHL players trained by Karn Skating Dynamics. Their teaching methods have reached far beyond Minnesota, the United States, and Canada as they've done several hundred team, coaches, hockey associations, club clinics, and seminars throughout North America and Europe. If you look on their website, it clearly states that power skating is dead and has been replaced by the glide platform training method. A true master coach and instructor with over 30 years of experience. I was working out the other day and for some reason a thought popped into my head. Is there a proven, bulletproof way to build an elite hockey player? I went through the experience as a player, raised two boys who have done well, have a nephew playing in the NHL, as well as a long list of players I've trained over the last decade and a half that have earned a college scholarship, major junior roster spot, professional contract, or became an Olympic medalist. Barry Karn and I's lives parallel each other in so many ways. And one of those ways is he also has a long list of players that have gone on to and are continuing to do great things as well. So logically, it made sense to partner with him on this podcast, combining our lifetime of hockey experiences, to see if we can help you build an elite hockey player. So ladies and gentlemen, please help me in welcoming Barry Karn to the show. Mr. Karn, welcome back to the Hockey Journey Podcast. Thanks, Lance. I'm really looking forward to it. It's, it's going to be a good day. Me too. Uh, I've been noodling on this uh, the last couple days, and when you agreed to I mean, we didn't even know what this episode was going to be about. Uh, I know that when I interviewed you, uh, whatever episode that was, 12, uh, you had mentioned at the end that I want to interview you and we didn't know what it was. And uh, the, the concept popped into my head was when I was working out the other day, I threw it over to you and you said, yeah, let's do this. So we, what we're going to do today uh, is 
we're going to try to help a family, parents that are new to the sport, that don't have a lot of hockey knowledge. Uh, if you have the intention, you know, maybe you're the parents of uh, the next Tiger Woods in hockey or the, the Williams sisters, and you're, you're going to try to to build this from scratch. Uh, we're going to combine our knowledge, which, uh, I mean, you've been in the business uh, training and coaching for over 30 years. Is that right? Yeah, 38. 38. <laughs> 38 years. Yeah, it's been a long time. Do you really want me to? Do you want me? You want me to say four decades or just <laughs> over thirty? <laughs> you let so, a lot. Just say a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and then my my uh, minuscule twenty some years of coaching. Uh, we're going to combine those, and we're going to try to put to, put an episode together that uh, hopefully gives some people some insight on uh, this journey. When if you want to introduce your kid to hockey and what it all entails and uh, what the best practices uh, would be. So without further ado, my friend, let's kick it off. All right, beautiful. All right, sorry, I just had to get a drink of water. How to, how to, this is the timeline. I got a little bit, we got a little bit of a script just to kind of keep us on course, but we're just going to kind of go back and forth. So this is the timeline for building an elite hockey player. So number one, location and birth year. Um, if you're girlfriend, boyfriend, if you're newly married, thinking about having kids, this is something you got to think about, <laughs> you know, because, uh, first birth year matters, uh, when you are born, uh, <laughs> and it's funny, uh, we're, we, we both get into in front of a lot of <laughs> parents and a lot of times, uh, they, they'll refer to their kid, not by their name, but by what? Birth year. <laughs> I got this, I got this, this 10, this 09. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. And you have to count backwards if you're not a hockey player. Yeah. And once you don't have kids in there, then that doesn't matter anymore. You know, you don't, you can't do the math. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> so if you are wanting to introduce your, uh, your to be son or daughter to the sport of hockey, uh, when your kid is born is important. Uh, if you, a uh, book that I would like to recommend is uh, called Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell. And uh, from a birth year perspective, there he, he cites a Canadian psychologist, uh, Roger Barnsley, where him and his wife were at a junior hockey game in uh, whatever the major, uh, the Ontario Hockey League or whatever it was. Uh, what is it? The OHL up there? Or what's the, what's the whole league called up there? CHL. CHL. So the CHL, they're at a game and the wife noticed that uh, the roster was the majority of the, the kids, their, their, birth, their birth month was in the first three months of the year. Yes. Um, and, you know, if you think about it, uh, the first few years in hockey really don't matter. But when, you know, you get older, uh, you know, think about a kid that's born in January and is going on the ice for the first time as a four-year-old or, or a three-year-old uh, a year later, you know, he's got eight months, 11 months, 10 months ahead of that kid of experience, and they're going to be better if they bet on the ice more than, than the other kid. Oh, exactly. It's crazy. Well, and um, that, that, that amount of months at really young ages is a huge percentage of their life, really. So it's a big difference. It is. So uh, potential moms and dads, uh, kind of when you're getting to the moment of uh, rocking and rolling, make sure you're trying to time it where they're going to be born in the first three months. <laughs> yes. Yeah. January. So count back nine months and get on your romantic horse. There you go. <laughs> All right. The other part of that is where you live. Um, and that also in the book Outliers, uh, they have a, a they reference that and they, they talk about Bill Gates and where he was born, um, how he was he had access to computers and uh, all that was coming way before anyone else and uh, had hundreds, thousands of hours uh, before anyone else did. Um, so location from a hockey perspective, we live in Minnesota. It would be like, a kid living in Minnesota, 
and a kid living in somewhere in a remote place in Iowa. Right. Uh, you're just not going to have the same opportunities, experiences, training, uh, and it's going to be tougher. So uh, where, when you're going to have your kid and where you're going to bring them up, really important. Yeah, okay. that's, that's interesting. I just, I, I just briefly saw this thing, uh, Buenos Aires, and there was a, I think it was about a 50-story skyscraper with a painting of Lionel Messi on the side. Oh, and, wow. and so if you're in Buenos Aires, who are your heroes going to be, right? So <laughs> that makes a big difference. It's not going to be Connor McDavid. <laughs> <laughs> So, no. uh, so that takes us to number two, and that's, uh, you know, parents are going to influence what's going to happen in their kids' life. Uh, you know, we want to introduce them to, to the sport. So from the birth of your kid to, uh, I would say, year three, um, to me, it would be watching hockey on TV, maybe going to some hockey games here in Minnesota, Gopher games, uh, St. Thomas, uh, you know, all the Minnesota, St. Cloud, uh, boys and girls. Uh, and then uh, another one to me that is a great introduction to the sport is just a knee hockey set. Yes. So what, what, what do you think on, you know, from birth to year three? Oh, I love it. it. You know, I mean, my kids, both of them started walking at eight and a half months and, and I, and I don't know if it was a uh, just a genetic thing, but I was like, I want this kid. Why why should I let him wait till he wants to? <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm like he's I'm sitting on the couch and they're standing on my lap and I'm holding on to their hands, sort of just barely. And they're little kids, and they you know when they want to sit down, they sit down. But we were doing that all the time, and eight and a half months is you know they're not mature enough to be running around pulling things out of the cupboards yet. So it was a bit of a nightmare from that standpoint. But they they started walking early. And, you know, little tiny kids like that, as soon as they're able to, you know, I remember playing uh, two-dimensional catch, okay? So you get the yeah. big, uh, big long uh, kitchen table, and they're sitting at the other end, and I put a couple of boards up so there's a boundary, and you're just rolling the ball back and forth, and they're, you know, they're trying to catch it where maybe if I throw it in the air, that's just too complex for them. And they start to get a little bit of, you know, we make a little goal. Now we got in my, my, uh, my, uh, uh, dining room table curiously looks like a hockey rink it's a big white oval right <laughs> so you know they're, just, yep. like, they're, they're playing catch with it and uh you know they're playing catch with the ball and then that just keeps going to anything i mean just anything you could possibly do that just gets them to move and and use their creativity and their coordination and the challenge and just have the fun and you mentioned bringing them to games and it's nice to bring them to games where there's the big bright lights and there's some music and it's a spectacle and I also like to bring them to little tiny kid games where they're like, Hey, I think I could maybe do that someday when, yes. I'm, a, when I'm a big boy, you know what I mean? And you just take I never them thought the, about that. Never yeah. thought about that. Yeah. It's a little bit more of a connection. It's, it's kind of why I have young people working for me because I'm the old man. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so you, you just get that little bit more connection with your students and that kind of thing. And so, yeah, anyway, so yeah, I, I think that's just so important at such a young age and, and uh, the kids can, you know, I remember there's this, uh, what it's called a strider. It's the bike with no chain, no pedals. And it's basically kids just sort of straddle it and they ride around. There's no training wheels. There's nothing. And my granddaughter uh, started riding that thing at like 18 months. She was, you know, she was living with us at the time. And I'd take her, I, I would just bring the thing in the house. It's got like foam wheels, right? And she would pick it up and play with it for literally 17 seconds. You know, I'd, I'd just put her on yeah. and she'd be on there for 17 seconds and put it down. And then I'd do it again and later on, later on, later on. Pretty soon she's picking it up herself and then she's rolling around. And, and I think this was just before uh, or just after the thaw, I brought her outside and she didn't even have to say anything. It's like balance, pick up your feet. She rolls all the way down the sidewalk. And it's like, it's the most amazing type thing. And, and I never really realized that you can get an 18 month old kid riding a bike. You know what I mean? Yeah. And cause I had seen a, like a two year old do it. And I was like, 
well, geez, you know, I'm going to get one of those things. That's the most amazing training tool I've ever seen, you know? And so, yeah, they're doing things like that. I think it's just awesome for little kids and balance is the key. Anytime you can get them balancing on things, you know, Hey, see if you can stand on top of that puck, see if you can stand on it for 10 seconds. You know what I mean? Little things like yeah. that with their little tiny feet. It's so great for them. But this reminds me of that, uh, <laughs> that video that, was pretty viral of that little girl on that balance board dribbling. Oh yeah. 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 <laughs> you know, yeah. You, how old, she's like two and a half. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And I, cool. Go yeah, ahead. No, no, go ahead. I mean, no, those I, are I, the experiences though. Like you saw that and boy, I wish I would have seen that when I had a tiny little kid who was less than two years old, you know, you just, you see the, the, uh, you know, I've made all the mistakes in the world, every parenting mistake and coaching mistake that you can make. I'm sure I've made it. And because I, (laughs) yeah. And because I've been doing this forever and I want to be good and I don't want to make those mistakes. I don't want to fix those things and get better and better and better. You know, you, you can, you can, I guess you can help other people too, but boy, you know, seeing it like that, it's just a mind blower. Yeah. All right. We're progressing. Yeah. Next one. Uh, You're going to introduce your kid. You know, you went through the the steps and now you're into it and you're going to throw them out on the ice for the first time. So for me, with my kids, it was throwing skates on them, you know, after they you know, playing knee hockey or, you know, we're just playing goalie, passing back and forth like you were talking about. Yep. Now we're going to uh, go head out onto the ice. Uh, it may be uh, going on the ice just in shoes, but they have, they have the experience at home walking around in skates. You throw them out there. Um, and then I guess it would – if they, they kind of gravitate to it where, you know, a parent brings their kids to a rink, puts them out on the ice surface and they come off and they're like, yay, that was cool. Let's, uh, let's do that again. They're going to find someone like you. Uh, and if they're in Minnesota, they better find you because you're, you and Jody are number one. Um, you take it from there. What happens then when you get someone that is at the very, very beginning? Okay, this is uh, this is great. I'm going to back up one second because I think there's something else that happens at about age two. It, you know, this is what the uh, psychology world will say about age two. You introduce disagreeable training. Okay, so little two year old Lance is uh, you know it's it's time to set the table for dinner, and you're two, so you might be able to handle put a spoon in front of every chair, you know, that kind of thing. And of course you're also the kind of Lance who's already got a hockey stick and you're shooting and mom's saying, Hey, set the table. And you're like, yeah, I don't want to, you know what I mean? And, and it's like set the table and you kind of, you, you fight it a little bit. And then, then now you have to go sit down on the steps and you can't shoot. You can't, you can't do anything. You're not getting what you want. So you scream a little bit. And then, and then I walk over and I say, Hey Lance, when you're ready to be a human being here and, 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 uh, and rejoin the family, you can get up, but you have to set the table first, right? You have to put the spoons down and then the kid does it, right? And then you make a big deal out of it at dinner. You know, your brothers, your sisters, mom, dad, everybody's sitting there and you say, hey, Lance, Lance helped with dinner today. He put all the spoons in front of the chair and everybody's, and everybody's like, yeah, like that, right? <laughs> and, and so now the little kid is learning some responsibility and that that dopamine surge for achieving something at a young age, he's learning to do something that's maybe a little disagreeable, but there's a pot of gold at the end of it that he never knew existed. He thought the pot of gold was just doing whatever you want. And so that, I think that's an important thing for young parents to do with young kids and to kind of push through that and, uh, and have them do it. And you just do it in small little kind of steps and, Pretty soon, it's like the whole table's being set by a three-year-old, right? And that, that's pretty darn good. And, and if it's done right, it's not a struggle each time because they've learned there's no way out. 
you, you just do these steps and it's really small. You're not controlling every aspect of the kid's life. You're just teaching them these little things so that when they do actually hit the ice, you know, there's little things that are disagreeable about that. All of a sudden, I, you know, I got a pair of skates on that make me feel like, uh, you know, I'm, uh, you know, I don't have my shoes anymore. I don't feel like I can really bend my ankles and move my feet around the same. And, um, and I think walking around in skates out on the rubber or at home on the carpet, like take some hockey tape and put it over the blades so they're not cutting up mom's carpet, but they can kind of walk around and feel what they feel like. And you can do that at a really young age. Like they, they can be really small and, and you have to be patient and, and have it only last a minute and a half sometimes. You know, and, and I think the best way to have them get over it is when they're on the carpet, they have their little stick and a ball so they can forget about the skates and you just play with them until yes. they go, nah, my feet hurt. Right. It's like, okay, well, let's take them off and then keep playing. And, and, and then all of a sudden it's going to be like this thing where, Hey, we put our skates on first cause that's what hockey players do. And then let's take them off and play. And, and so, you know, they'll do that disagreeable thing because they have a little bit of that kind of training. This is the way life goes. You start out a fool and maybe a little uncomfortable and you just sort of keep working through it. Right. So, yeah. So that's, that's, I think a precursor to hitting the ice would be that kind of thing. And then when you learn to skate, I mean, the first thing that I think. Hold on, know, hold on. Time off. Yeah, go ahead. I, I got, I got to, I got to interject because this is some good stuff here. Um, before you take them, you and Jody and your kids take them on the ice and start molding them like a lump of clay. A uh, couple tips for parents. Number one, what, what you just talked about, you do not reward goals, uh, assists, anything like that. You reward effort. Yes. Uh, don't, because <laughs> there, well, I'll have an <clears throat> episode on that. It's funny that you kind of brought that up. Uh, that there, there's scientific evidence that s shows that stuff is this short lived, almost yes. like intimid, almost uh, similar to intimidation coaching or training. Mm -hmm. uh, it's your impact is initially very noticeable, but over time, it it's nothing. Um, the other thing is introducing the the hockey sport. Uh, to your kids, you know, watching it, whatever, uh, doing the different things. And like you said, putting the skates on and achieving something for me, extreme. There was, there was a time I'm not proud of it, but I, I flipped a pancake or two with a hockey stick in front of my kids when they were really young. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome though. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, all right, we're, we're, we're going to hit the ice now. <laughs> Take oh, them on good. the ice. Okay, so they're on the they're on the ice and and uh, and and okay, so like you said, it's good stuff. You know the whole uh, the two different kind of incentive systems. One is is like a consumptive one. I'm hungry. I'm going to eat, and then that one's destroyed. You've eaten. You have nothing, right? So the other thing would be a dopaminergic thing, which is uh, the only time you get that dopaminergic surge, which makes you feel good and and kind of worthwhile, is when you take steps towards something that is better than you so it's a value okay. system and there's a goal there and, it, and it's like so that's what you're trying to do with all this kind of stuff and but you have to prepare them because it's disagreeable at first it's uncomfortable at first right so now we're on the ice and it's like well, first of all we got to get them moving and we also want to get them to know okay we just got off of this this uh, I got friction I'm walking on the rubber all of a sudden I get on the ice and and wow there is nothing there and normally we have friction when we walk linearly forward and backward we can just put a foot out and stop and now there's nothing there so you're you've thrown them into complete chaos right and so the first thing they do is they want to hold on to the boards and that's fine okay they just want to hold on to the boards and they can stay really close i recommend that they learn how to skate before you give them a chair before you hold their hands that they actually learn how to stand on the slippery surface and you're right there. So they feel really safe. 
Okay. Yeah. Like you're maybe on your knees and you've set them down. You're on your knees, maybe on the rubber. And they're actually just standing there with their back to the rink next to you. And their hands are out and you just hold them there. And then you can, you can have a march. They can just sit there and march a little bit. And then when they fall, you catch them. And then you lay them down on the ice so that they know that down there is not the end of their life. <laughs> Because <laughs> when you're a little kid and you got and you got skates on, you are falling into hell or something or some. There's a dragon, right? And so, yeah, uh, you know, you, you lay them down and then you show them how to get up. You know, roll over, mm -hmm. get on your hands and knees. You know, kick up onto one foot, try and stand up, and they might wipe right back out again. But that's where you want them to fall from first while they're trying to get up because that's a six inch fall, right? Right. So it's standing straight up and down. That's a pretty, that could be a good head knocker, right? And so they start to feel what it feels like to hit the ice and have their legs slide out from under them and whatever. And you, there's just a ton of information. The, the vestibular system or the balance system in a kid is lightning fast and they learn incredibly fast. So when, when falling is a little less threatening when they're already down and they're just trying to get up, that's a great way to do it. And then once they get up on the ice and they're standing there, you have them rocking back and forth on their inside edges. So we just tell them rock like a penguin and they'll rock, <laughs> they'll rock back and forth and probably pick their foot up about a quarter inch off the ice. You're just barely, and that's fine. And, you, and then you go see if you can do it with soft knees and they start rocking back and forth. And then, eventually you might bring them out to say the blue line. Okay. So you bring them out to the blue line and you have them stand with one foot on either side of the blue line. And then what happens is they can sit there and rock and you say, see if you can get your nose from one side of the blue line to the other. And they're rocking back and forth. And yeah. then if you had them point their toes out like a duck and rock like that, they'll start moving forward. Yes. They'll just start moving forward and yes. they'll start moving forward on a glide plane rather than letting kids sort of naturally start walking like they're walking and rolling off their toes. That's a bad habit anyway. Um, and so we want to get them learning to shift weight and just stay on top of gliding blades. And yep. then eventually, you know, they'll get that figured out and you want, you know, their goal should be to go 10 feet, not all the way across the ice. You know, that, that would be like you going, I'm going to bring you to Lake Calhoun and do that all the way across. That's just way too far for a little kid, right? So you're just like, okay, do that to me, and I'm eight feet away, and they do it. And, and, and you don't know how that kid is. You know, has that kid had any disagreeable training? Well, if not, he might, he might take four steps and, and move, you know, nine inches, and you're going to go, good job, and then you go meet him. If he just keeps moving, you know he's had some. And he just keeps moving, keeps going. He might go 20 feet and you're fine. And then what happens is they'll, they'll get what it takes to propel themselves. And, and again, it's the vestibular system. So immediately they start to realize I'm pushing straight to the side and I'm going forward. This is weird. They don't think that way. They just know it and they get moving. And then what you do is you just have them start squatting. And then that, that rocking actually creates a spring in their leg that gives a little bit of a push. You're not telling them to push. You're just using their myotactic or bounce reflex in their leg. And then they start moving just by squatting and they start pulling their leg in because, you know, they starting to pull their leg in or let's call that a recovery uh, back and forth because all of a sudden their leg is pushing a little farther than it was before. Then you can get them to push, 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 glide, Right. Yep. So now they can stand there and they can glide and there's going to be a couple of fall downs where they can, you know, from a higher point like that, but they've already fall down and got up a bunch of times. Right. And so yep. they'll get up and, and do it again. And I always recommend for little kids to be in a group. Don't be by yourself. You ha you want to feel like you're in this with somebody else when you're a little kid. And there's a kid, there's some kids that are scared and they need to see another kid do it. So they realize I'm not going to die and blow up into a million pieces and never see my mother again. Right. They're going to, they're going to, yeah. they're going to, they're going to, and, and then there's a lot of value in wanting to fit in. And it's not like you're shaming them. They just want to fit in. And that's an important thing. A quick word from our sponsor, Sniper's Edge Hockey. 
Sniper's Edge Hockey is your one-stop shop for your at-home hockey training needs on and off the ice. Find the perfect start to your at-home training area with slick tiles, synthetic ice, or a rink liner. Or upgrade your home setup with one of our top quality training tools to help you work on soft hands, all of your deeks and dangles, perfect your one-timer, and improve the power and accuracy of your shot. Find it all online and in stock for immediate shipping at snipersedgehockey.com. I'm going to interrupt you because I want to tell you a little story about when I was introducing my kids to hockey. Uh, My oldest, Rem, we were down in Florida, and he was probably, I think, the last year that we were were down there. He was four four years old. And this this will go back to uh, how important location is because we lived in a golf course community when we played down there. Um, not on the beach. I should have lived on the beach. I don't know what I was thinking, <laughs> but we were, we were close to the practice ring cause I didn't like driving much. But anyways, I tried to introduce Rem to, to ice and skating and stuff, but, uh, brought, brought him to the rink and everything, but he never took to it because no, none of his buddies that he hung out with went to preschool with played hockey or were on the ice. Yeah. He had n- no interest in it. Right. Um, so it wasn't until uh, we got back to Minnesota and I retired that, you know, we started hanging out with players that, uh, or people that were playing hockey and then the growth happens. But the one, the one thing I want to talk about is my, uh, my experience with my youngest kid, uh, Rhett, uh, I, when I retired, I would, uh, I was going to start introducing him to hockey. You know, he, he's ready for it. And so the rink that we both know very well, Plymouth Ice Center, uh, they had a learn to skate program and, uh, through, you know, I signed him up, put him out there. And after the first day, you know, I played in the NHL. So I, you know, I'm watching, I'm like, I can help out there. <laughs> So I go to the lady uh, that was running it. I think the, I can't remember her name. I should have looked her up. But anyways, I uh, uh, went up to her after and I said, I, I got a level two coaching or whatever. I did the USA hockey stuff. Yeah. Uh, I have a kid out there. Uh, I Tell me what you'd like me to do. I'd love to come out on the ice and just be an extra body for you. And she was very appreciative. So the... <laughs> The first day that I went out there, there she gave me like three kids, including my son. And uh, I'm 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 doing whatever drill I'm doing. And there's one kid that when he falls down, and you know you and Jody know this that when he falls down or she falls down, you try to help him up, and they're they're like a, a wet noodle. You know. <laughs> yep. There's there's no effort trying to get back up. <laughs> they're right. just like. Uh, is this a massage? This is awesome. <laughs> so I got that kid. You know, it's a, his name's Charlie. I didn't, you know, I saw the name on his helmet. So go through that session, and I'm tired. My back's sore because I'm picking this kid up all the time. And I go off the ice surface, and there's this woman that comes screaming, like, Lance, Lance, <laughs> uh, from the stands down. Uh, it's this gal named Maureen. So when I played for the Gophers, uh, Stubb and Herbs, which you know, sure. was a big was a big part, you know, of uh, go for hockey with the boosters and fans. They would always go there. So I lived on top of, or right next door, a flower shop right next door to Stubb and Herbs, and uh, Maureen was uh, a waitress bartender at Stubb and Herbs. So I I got to know her <laughs> yeah. through college and. I actually, uh, as a summer job, they gave me a job as bouncing. I don't know why. I was, you know, I had no muscles. <laughs> but anyways, uh, so I had that relationship with her, uh, her now husband, Mike. And then I left and turned pro and didn't see them again until that moment on the ice with Charlie. <laughs> right, right. And That's then, funny. And Charlie became Rhett's best friend. I mean, we, we, uh, we, <laughs> this is, okay, I'm going to, I want you to talk more than me, but once that happened, when we introduced, uh, we, we got connected again, 
she would call me and say, hey, a bunch of us are going to the park. Uh, if you want to come, stop on over. And I was like, Maureen, I don't want to get together at the park with anyone. I don't want to change coupons or anything. <laughs> I'll take your kid one day a week and give you a break. And then I'd like you to take my kid <laughs> one day so I can have a little break. Yeah. And that that's kind of how that, that emerged. And I would bring my kids to New Hope Ice, Ice Arena. And like you said, um, as you're introducing hockey to players, when I would bring Maureen's kid, Charlie, and there was another gal, uh, LaDonna, her, her daughter, uh, Chloe, I'd bring them to New Hope Arena, and sometimes we were on the ice literally for 10 minutes, 5 minutes, mm -hmm. where they're just like, I don't want to be there. Yeah. And then you just keep on introducing it, and then by the end, you know, three weeks, four weeks later, we're, we're there for 45 minutes to an hour, and I got to pull them off the ice. Right, uh, right, right. And then we go for a burger, and I drop them off, and my day's over in success. And that, that's really important is to, to not force it on them. Just introduce it and see what happens. If hockey's not the deal, then work on something else. Okay, I've talked enough. Go ahead. No, I think that's genius too, because that's what I was getting at is, you know, we're pack animals and, 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 and kids want to be with the pack. They don't want to go work on their skating by themselves with dad at open skating. Do you know what yes. I mean? And so you get buddies there and they forget themselves and they chase each other around. Right. And yep. so they just start, they just become, again, you're, you know, from the, from the science aspect, their vestibular systems are, are off the charts now. Now they can, now they're actually being aggressive and moving around on their skates because they're chasing each other around. Maybe they're getting in trouble with the skate guard, you know, or something <laughs> like, you know, it's like, God, you know, every time I go to the rink, I get to eat Skittles, you know? And so yep. they're like, so they do it. And like you said, like 10 minutes, it's like, you know, you introduce it to them and maybe they don't like it, but there, nobody loves it after 10 minutes anyway. So you just keep doing it and, and you hit on a couple of things and then you start doing it on a regular basis. And then they actually start thinking about it as, Hey, this is a, this is a recreation thing for, this is something we do. Right. And you get more people. I remember having Bo out on the ice and I knew that tennis coach at, uh, at the high school. Um, Cause I was coaching was coaching high school hockey with them back in the day and I, we had this big you know those big army duffel bags filled yeah. with tennis balls and we threw them all on the ice <laughs> there must have been like 300 of them and then i have you got about you got a few kids there and they got their sticks and it's just it's a war we would take all the we would take the nets and tip them over like pipes down and sideways so it's like whoever gets the most tennis balls in the other net wins you know like that kind of thing and they're just like again, they're just forgetting themselves and they're just having a blast. And, and, you know, we, we, th there was a birthday party where we were in a rink and turned all the lights off and all the guys had on where we had one team had the orange little glow necklace things on their wrists and stick and whatever. <laughs> the other guys had the yellow ones on and we had a glow ball and they're running around. And so she's just having fun. Right. So, yeah, that's, that's, that's great. I think you set that, that, that worked out great for you. Cause that's, I mean, my, my nephew, Brady Shea, who plays for Carolina, when he first came to lessons, his older brother, you know, his older brother's like, yeah, yeah, I'll do this. Okay. This I'll do the crossover. I'll stand on my back outside edge, whatever. And Brady's like, I don't want to, I don't want to do this. Right. So we, uh, you know, the next time we went, you know, he, his dad brought his skates, but he wasn't interested. So we just pulled him around on a sled and you're just like, we, we had one of those little, like, you know, the tubs they go on and whatever and had the ice. Yep. We're just pulling around, making sure he's just having a blast, spinning him around, you know, laying on your ice, spin him around with your stick. And he just was having fun. And then he wanted to come back because that was fun. And then he wanted to, you know, now there's more kids there and he's having, he, he wants to be with them. So, yeah. It's all about being a pack animal and, and letting them go at whatever steps they need to take. Absolutely. And one thing that you, you know, you talked about is, um, you know, parents, they're going to be the guiding force. But if you have 
an older, older sibling that's already playing the sport. It's just a natural gravitational pull that the younger one's going to do that. For sure. Um, and there was a study, I think it's the talent code. Don't uh, quote me on that, but there was a study done uh, of the world's fastest sprinters. And they just, whoever was the fastest sprinters at the time, they started dissecting their lives. And the one thing that they found that was totally impactful uh, and I told, I think that it can be applied to hockey as well. It totally applies to hockey is that, uh, there was not one of the fastest sprinters in the world at the time that was a firstborn. They were always later siblings. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that great? Yeah. <laughs> Try and keep up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So parents, you know, you with your kids, you were pushing the boundaries early, early, like, you know, do we have to wait for what everyone says? You know, I'm just going to accelerate this. If they can, I roll a ball to them and they can grab it and throw it back to me. Then I'm going to throw it out of their reach so they have to react to it and you keep on building. Yeah. Um, so we're on the ice and, you know, they got through the first couple days uh, and they like hockey. The next transition is uh, association hockey. Uh, did you have much involvement with the association of hockey? Yeah, I did. I actually did. I, I coached a little bit. I had a really, uh, a good buddy of mine that I coached with that, uh, basically right away we said, Hey, if my kid needs any information out here, I'll tell you yeah, <laughs> and you tell him so that we're not talking to our own kids and driving them crazy and feeling like they're being treated differently and all that kind of thing. And then every once in a while, he'd just go, shut up, dad. You know, like, <laughs> like he would say that, like, go, oh, give me a break, Barry. You know, like uh, his name was John. He would just go, give me a break. You don't even need to say that to him. You know, like we kept each other in line that way. Cause you know, of course you're, you, you get upset about something like you, you and, and uh, so anyway, that's how I learned about uh, the, those boundaries that you're not supposed to cross with your kids, but I crossed them anyway. And I recommend you don't. Okay. So anyway, yeah. So you, you get into the hockey association thing. So I actually coach uh, quite a bit, you know, up through uh, squirts and then about peewees, I actually realized one day uh, that, I'm not going to go to tryouts. I'm not even going to show up there because I, I don't want him somehow seeing me out of the corner of the eye, thinking that he's doing anything for me. He's got to learn how to do this on his own. Like we had this every day before or every time before it was time to sign up for hockey. Uh, we would have a kind of a sit down and I would say, Hey, listen, if you, uh, if you play hockey, you know, it's not just for you. It's, you know, it's for your teammates too. So you have to, if you're going to play hockey again this year, you have to commit to, uh, you know, doing the best you can for your teammates and that kind of thing. And then you can reevaluate when you're done. And he said, and yeah. I'm like, if you want to snowboard, if you want to ski, you want to do something like that, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll get you set up with that too. And he was kind of doing a little of that too. And you go, no, no, I want to play hockey. And so, and I said, well, listen, then you need to commit. You have to commit. You have to commit to that because this is a team now. This isn't just you. You know, there's an objective with this team. And, and it's not just you. And you have to commit to doing the best you can for them. So, yeah, we would have that, <clears throat> that conversation. And he would be, uh, you know, he'd be like, yeah, okay. And, and then you could refer to that all year long, you know, as, a, as yeah. opposed to, you know, having – having some kid who doesn't understand that yet. He's never gone down the long, dark tunnel um, and seen the light of day in the future. They don't know what it's like to team build and all that, but they do know what it's like to uh, be responsible to others because uh, you know, you've trained them in that way. And, and so, yeah, so we started doing that and I, I taught, I taught him a little bit to there. And then when he got to high school, uh, you know, I was coaching at that time. And so I just stayed off the bench and just went up and did stats for the years he was there. I just didn't do it. I just didn't want to be there. Wasn't in the locker room, just stayed away. But I was in, I was in practice quite a bit, but you know, at that point we had a pretty clear, 
we we had delineated our lines and I stayed away from them. So yeah. It's funny it's funny because they're um over the years of trained players here at at my house, uh there are so many parents that are so conscious of their relationship with their kid. And they don't want to, as you said, overstep those boundaries where they're the ones that, you know, their relationship is going to be strained or is going to be affected in a negative way because of mom or dad putting the pressure on the kid to, yeah. to succeed. Um, so many good things. So uh, you sign up for association hockey, so now you're committed to playing the sport. And what you just went through up until that point is the purest form of hockey. <laughs> yeah, right, right. You know, because you go to the rink and you're just, my kid got up today from falling <laughs> yeah. down. Yes. And now all of a sudden uh, things flip because even in those early days when, you know, they're just starting out, if you're at the beginning when you're at the rink when the kid's on the ice for the first time, there's always a kid that is better than yours. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And that's what starts the cycle. And then once you sign up for association hockey and start playing in scrimmages or games, then all of a sudden the, you know, my kids at a certain level, you know, the, the, the ranking starts of kids. Um, so before we get to the next part of hockey, uh, I just want to say that, Knee hockey, another marker to, to know if your kid's really into hockey is knee hockey. You know, we talked about you introduce it to them at that age, but now they're going to start having play dates with, with uh, friends that are over, and you'll notice that they're going to be playing knee hockey all the time. Yeah. Uh, you make pizza, Mom, because second period's coming up. <laughs> you know? Right. Uh, you know, you do that, and then... Uh, out pond hockey, I mean, in Minnesota during the winter, that's a big thing. Uh, when I was coaching mites, that, that was a huge marker for me uh, to, to tell me what player was more into hockey than others because once outdoor rinks started, uh, you know, getting operational, the kids that would – because mites, you know, you're, you're on the ice two days a week maybe, and then uh, that's it. You yeah, know, for, for here in Wyzetta, it was uh, on the weekends, and all of a sudden, by January or February, you started seeing kids that were separating themselves, and I, I investigated that. I started asking parents, what are they doing? You know, are you yeah. with Karn? Or, and a lot of them were with Karn, but... <laughs> but they have they, a backyard rink or something, right? They had a backyard rink and yeah. a pond, yeah. and they got yeah. extra reps there. Um, so that, that, you know, just to give parents, you know, an idea of what that looks like, you know, there, we're not giving you, uh, a magic formula. Uh, it, it has, a, a the, the main ingredient is putting in the work. Yes. You know? Yeah. You, you gotta, you gotta put in the work. So, um, now we're playing association hockey and for players that start, elevating themselves to the top, uh, they're going to start getting recruited by AAA programs. Uh, here in Minnesota, um, I got a few of the top ones would be um, the Minnesota Blades. I think they're the longest running AAA program here. Uh, the Machine, uh, Euro Hockey, um, I think Lumberyard Hockey, there, there, there's, there's so many I can't even keep track of, but uh, you know they, they get involved in uh, the AAA program. So when that starts, what does that look like? And what I want to warn parents, and I, I don't know how much you got into AAA hockey with your kids, Barry, but uh, there's a trap where if your kid kind of rises to the top, and even if they don't, I mean that it's a it's a business these right. tournaments. Right. That don't fall into the trap of uh, playing every weekend tournament that you can because all of a sudden that's going to be your summer and you're going to be uh, at Labor Day and going, 
we didn't have any fun. All we did is play hockey. You know, yeah, right, tournaments. right. Exactly. Ex- yeah, exactly. And, and for someone to say we didn't have any fun and they were playing hockey, then you know something's wrong. Right. So, yeah, uh, yeah it, and it's like, it, you know, and, and to go back to really just briefly the pond hockey thing, you can have a rink in your backyard and you can have a rink on a pond and it's not going to do your kid any good unless he actually plays on it and he plays on it with kids that, you know, his friends like you got to have they have to have be having fun. It has to be a five below day and your kid walks in and he's actually sweaty because there were enough guys out there that just pushed each other to just do stuff. And they just were having fun. And I remember my buddy, John, again, my, my, uh, we were coaching mites and we'd bring him over to this place called Lewis park, which was just famous for shinny hockey games in Edina. And it was a big, uh, bandy rank and a rink and another like little sort of call it maybe a figure skating rink, that kind of thing. And they had all kinds of uh, little uh, shitty hockey nets all over the little two by fours with the openings yep, yep. and all that kind of stuff. And they had all these boundaries for the bandy rank. And, uh, you know, I remember going over there and Bobby Smith would be there and, and we would be, uh, you know, we'd be putting games together. There'd be a bunch of guys who were playing hockey and then the high school guys would show up and, and, and it would be like, Okay, it's 12 on 12 on a rink, right? And it's just, it's, uh, most people can't function in something like that. And it's just so much fun to have no space or anything and be pushed to your limit about what you're trying to pull off, right? And we would do that kind of stuff. And I bring, and then all of a sudden I'm going to, okay, my son's home from school. Uh, we got, I would, I would do these practices where the kids would meet there. We would get the ice and no coaches on the ice, right? So we would just go help tie up skates. We'd throw them out on the ice. And then John and I would go, we're going to do a grill and cook a bunch of hot dogs. And we got a, uh, we got a, a cooler full of uh, Gatorade or whatever we had and the kids are out there and all of a sudden we walk over and we're like, what are you guys doing? Aren't you guys going to play? And they're like, we don't know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> so we we like, we like, okay, everybody throw your sticks in a pile and I put them in half and I go, there's the teams. And they're like, what do you mean? And they'd like pick up the sticks and I go, there's the team. And they go, yeah, well, they got Johnny, blah, blah, blah. And I go, you guys fight about it. We'll be back here. All right. You guys just take care (laughs) of fight about it till it's even and then start playing. And they would, they would fight about it. There were no adults around. So it didn't get out of hand (laughs) because it'll get out of hand if there's adults around. So we just let them go and they, uh, they started playing and, and we would do that at least once, if not twice a week. And again, it was, we had to organize it a little bit. So there were enough kids there, but now that they already understand organization, we got practice tonight. And then it's like, we're going to Lewis and there's not going to be any coaches. Now they're always showing up. Like nobody missed those. They'd, there are kids that would miss the weekends because they're going to grandma's or something like that, but they never miss that. So, yeah. and, and it was so much fun and they understood how to create something on their own. So when they had their buddies over in their backdoor yard rink and pond, they knew what to do. And they, or they'd be like, you know, this isn't very fun out here with just me or just one other guy. Let's, let's call our buddies and have their, have them come over and we could play at least three on three or something, you know? So anyway, yeah. and then you, and you move into the triple A thing. Uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a firm believer of do everything, do anything, um, you know, like shoot baskets, you know, learn how to use a lacrosse stick, do And whether you're going to play all those uh, organized things or not, I mean, there's some value in playing other organized things or not, but I, I really believe that they should do other things and there should be breaks in there where, they leave their skates and they come back so rusty that they feel like, Oh my God, my buddies are, they're ahead of me. And it's like, no, they're not. You're just rusty. Get it back. And it's kind of a, it's a, it's a mindfulness that they have to have to get their skill back that keeps going with them. They have to push to keep up again. Like you were talking about the the sprinters, they have to kind of push to keep up again. And, and I think that's a, there's value in, in some of that. And then the fact that like, you know, my, my nephew, Brady Shea, again, who plays for Carolina, he's a scratch golfer, you know, like he, he would, uh, he would take time off in the spring because he was, 
He liked golfing. And now that he's older and he's the best golfer on the team, he loves it. You know, he loves that kind of thing. And he golfs a lot and it's a good get away from hockey, but he also is the kind of guy that was a quarterback as a ninth grader in high school uh, on the varsity team. So he's a great athlete like Paul Martin, right? Uh, division one contracts for th- or, uh, uh, offers for baseball, football, and hockey. And it's like, well, he's a freak, you know, yeah, yeah. He's, a, he's a freak, but he's still, he did those things because he enjoyed them. And he did those things because he enjoyed, enjoyed problem solving. And there's, there's problems that you solve trying to hit a baseball or, or keep yourself calm enough to turn a double play correctly that you're not going to necessarily always learn in hockey. Or how about, uh, you know, we look at hockey and we see these one-timer plays and we just go, God, that's just amazing that the guy is seeing that blade before the puck ever gets to his stick. And there's like a three, four man tic-tac-toe goal. And you just go, okay, that's amazing. That's a highlight. We're going to see it for the rest of the year on NHL channel. And it go, you know what that is? That's volleyball. Yeah. You know, every, everything's one timer. I mean, can you learn something from volleyball? Yeah. I mean, just the whole vectoring of, of being able to see where you're going with this ball that's being spiked at you. It's got to go right to the setter. It's yeah. like, it's just great. All that stuff is good for you. So awesome. Um, you know, one, one point from that segment that I just want to reinforce is that, uh, there, there's a study done, and I apologize for not, not having exactly who, uh, who did it, but uh, you will be the average of the fly, five closest people you spend the most time with. So if you're... Oh, yeah. Okay, cool. If, the, if those people are all soccer players, you're probably going to play soccer. But from a, an elitist standpoint... Uh, that's what kind of happens in this process is that through the camps or teams that you play on, you're going to kind of gravitate uh, toward these other people and you're going to start doing additional training, either camps or uh, maybe seeing you, not just for the learn to skate, but now for let's, let's, how are we going to build towards elite status? And that takes us to our uh, next subject is uh, specialization, uh, coaching and training. Uh, when does that begin? From a skating standpoint, I mean, when they sign up for a learn to skate program, it starts very early, but uh, there's all kinds of other things that uh, once you set on this journey, a technical skating specialist like you, an off-ice stick skills instructor like me, um, an on-ice uh, skills instructor, Vision training, there's people that work on that exclusively. Strength and conditioning coach, uh, sports psychologist, mindful coach, nutritionist. Uh, as you get older, uh, the one thing that happened with my boys is they started growing. You started having uh, injuries. So you need a physical therapist, an athletic trainer, a chiropractor, doctors. And then what's come out most recently in probably the last five to six years is uh, video analysis coaches where you send in your shifts and they give you feedback on it, on how to be better. Yes. So when, when does that all happen? Uh, you know, and what does that player look like? Gosh, I, I, I think one of the, one of the uh, greatest things about what you're doing right now with podcasts like this and bringing people in is that, pieces of all of the things that you just mentioned can be, they can be used on a three-year-old, right? Like, does he, does he need to be doing, uh, you know, formalized skating lessons and stick handling and uh, mindfulness training, (laughs) you know, right. How to deal with your anger, you know, all that kind of stuff. Does he need to be able doing that? Yes, he does. He needs to be doing that, but it needs to be done in, in, you know, the baby steps that's appropriate for the age that they're at and that they're, uh, and, and that it's, it's part of the enjoyment and part of their problem solving. Like we don't want to give them problems that they can't solve. They're not, they're not the, all you're going to do is, 
beat them down, beat them back. You're giving them, you're giving them problems that they can solve. Right. Yeah, so yeah. I have kids that have started, like I have this little girl who skates with me on Wednesday mornings and she's out there with high school kids and she's nine years old, Lance. <laughs> she's nine. And I look at her and I go, I go, you know, uh, you know, I was just talking about it just uh, yesterday. I go, you know, I don't think I've, have you heard, uh, what's her name? Uh, I think it's Olivia. And I go, have you ever heard a word come out of Olivia's mouth? And my son goes, no, I haven't. And I go, I go, my God, she's just, she's so shy that way. But from the skating standpoint, she makes the right attempt at absolutely everything. And you almost never have to go talk to her about making adjustments yeah. on, on what she's doing. So she fits out there. And then there's these other kids, obviously, that are powerful. It's kind of funny that you would have somebody out there like that. But she's so, and I bring it up. And I actually will bring up your, Olivia, come here. Do what you just did around that cone. I want everybody to see it because that was unreal. And she'll just go do it. Like she's, she's not afraid of anything. But if you just look at her, she looks like she's starting to tremble just as you walk towards her. Like she's, like she's really nervous. But she's got something in her that's just fearless, right? So there are things she can do that you can't say, okay, she's nine. Well, I want my nine-year-old to do it. It's like, well, your nine-year-old doesn't even want to put a shoe, tie his shoes, okay, yeah, before school. So I don't think he's going he's gonna to work in this situation. So it really is a, how well are you mentally prepared? And so it brings us back to the first step of the disagreeable training and, and learning how to, how to uh, reach small goals and things like that. Because you, you like this little nine year old, because I know her older brother too, and her older brother is just like, there's nothing he can't, there's not a problem you can throw at him where he won't go, all right, I have no idea what to do, but I'm going to, I'm going to know, I'm going to figure it out. Where, you know, I would say the vast majority of kids, you throw a problem like that, like whatever, you know, whatever big problem at them, and they're going to go, oh, my God, that's too much. I can't do that. I can't do that. And then they'll sort of walk away and not even think about it anymore because they don't even think about life as a set of roadblocks that you just have to figure out how to get around, over, under, through, whatever works, right? And so, um, yeah, that's, that's, I think, the, the whole process and when you when you kind of know how to deal with your kids that way you kind of know what what to start adding to it and and there's it's not like a late someone late bloomer can't do it it's just that there are certain things that if they aren't done at when they're young they're going to be pretty they're not going to be automatic let's put it that way later on in life yeah. you know you, you got to build those neurons between two and eight years old, I think it is, for them to really, really thrive at problem solving when they get older. So yeah. that's, that's my biggest emphasis with little kids is learning how to problem solve, learning how to be brave to do it, and teaching them what is keeping them from doing it. And it's, it's usually just a lack of information that's causing uh, anxiety, right? So that anyway... I, I, I'm going on and on here, but I hope that's uh, kind of what you were getting at. No, it's awesome. And, you know, the one thing that I'd like to focus on from a coaching perspective is, you know, we, we, we have control over the early years of, of these players. And we know as adults that in order to get to the next level, wherever they're at, is that there's going to be a lot of failures. Yeah. And for us to set the stage where that's not a negative and that's a positive and great job. Uh, I, my, my coaching is the absolute most difficult. I told my coaches <laughs> that my assistant coaches, I said, if you don't come off this ice sweating, you have failed. <laughs> yes. Yes. You know, cause it's putting on the clown suit and it's making it fun and it's, you know, when they fail, how can we make that a, a positive experience where they want to get up and try it again? Um, right, right. So this is amazing. This no, podcast. I agree. And because and, I have little kids, I have this, I have little kids, uh, Drake, 
you know, little Drake. Okay. Yep. So little Drake, uh, you know, just, uh, I think it was, uh, Tuesday, two, one, Wednesday morning, little Drake came up, you know, I was, I was talking to his dad and I was going, and he's the youngest guy in his group. And I'm going, can you guys come an, a half hour earlier? Would that be hard? He's going, oh, yeah, no, no, that's no problem. You know, and he's like, I wake up in the morning and Drake's all dressed and he's ready to roll. <laughs> so Drake, Drake is, I don't know what he is, eight, maybe seven. Yeah. yeah. I think I met him when he's seven. he's seven. He's like seven or eight. And he's so far, he's so far advanced over kids that are three, three to four years older um, from the standpoint of looking at paying attention to me from the standpoint of uh, what is it I, you want me to do? Well, I want you to sit back, hold your foot out in front of you on a back outside edge around the net, uh, around the cone. And he just does it. And I might have to say something. Okay. Just straighten your back out. That's pretty good. And then the other kids, I got to tell them 15 times and, and we have to film them and we have to show them and we have to do that kind of thing. And so it's like, you know, I really think he should be out with older kids. He just has, uh, a real aptitude for what's going on out there and all that. And that's what I tell Drake too. And I'm like, I pull him up and, and he demonstrates and I'm not against shocking people with, you know, you're 11 and there's an eight year old demonstrating. I mean, cause that should be a shock. I, and I'm not there to, I'm not there to, uh, you know, demean anybody. I just say, Drake, demonstrate this. That was awesome. <laughs> and yeah, it's like, oh, yeah. You know, and it, and it should like there's that's part of the disagreeableness of of life is you think hey everything's going on just perfect and i'm doing well and then all of a sudden someone blows you away and you're like wow i'm not doing as good as i thought i was maybe i had to you know wake up a little maybe put a little of this into it pay attention a little more here get a few more reps blah 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 so yeah it's uh in those those moments where you recognize a young kid and have them do something in front of others. I mean, you said that, I can't remember her name, but her lower lip was quivering when she was going to demonstrate, but she did it. Yep. Um, those are huge moments for them where they're getting, uh, I guess, a return on their investment. Where sure. They're putting in some extra work and coaches having me demonstrate Holy cow. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, I, so, exactly. And that's exactly, you know, and then I can go up to that little girl afterwards. I can go up to that little girl afterwards and I go, Hey, how'd you feel when I called you up to the front? And she's like, just staring at me. I go a little scared and she kind of shakes her head up and down. I go, how'd you feel afterwards? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like, how'd you feel afterwards? And and again, she's not talking because she's just so shy. And I go, that feels pretty good, doesn't it? And she shakes her head up and yeah. down. I go, you earned that. I go, that was a lot of work to get to the point where you got to the, where you were demonstrating to all these other skaters. Said, that was a lot of work and you did a great job. And it's like, that's what the whole dopaminergic, uh, you know, it's dopamine, right? And then there's a little shot of adrenaline there and epinephrine and, and you just feel great and you actually feel compelled. I want to do that again right now. Now, yes. you know, now you're making the right steps. You're doing the right steps. I, I got to do that again. I am craving that. So, yes. yeah. Whew. I, I need to take a nap from all that goodness. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, uh, I, I <coughs> sorry, I, <coughs> I like to keep, I didn't know there were mosquitoes here in Minnesota in December. Wow. <laughs> when this flew into my mouth. Climate. <laughs> perfect climate. Uh, so we're, we're still at the, the fun time. Um, it, 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 it gets a little goofy as we progress up to the, to the higher levels and, I like to keep these podcasts around an hour, uh, so we're there. So we're going to have to do another episode, Mr. Karn, and we're going to talk about what happens after, you know, you, you start playing AAA and uh, for the players that start, you know, moving their way up to the top, uh, that opens up a whole new can of uh, worms and 
uh, responsibilities and also challenges. Yeah. And like what happens when someone says they don't love you anymore? <laughs> right. Yeah. Cause it's going to, it happens to everybody. Yeah. And you know, uh, we, we talk about the, the physical training of getting better at hockey, but as you get older, you know, life intersects, uh, it, you know, your story, you, you had a, a tough childhood, um, and that happens to other people. And, you know, can this sport be uh, a foundation for them or a beacon of uh, quietness or, you know, happiness where sure. they can get through the different things? So we got a lot more to talk about. We're going to do it in the next episode. You are amazing, my friend. Thank you for being here. And uh, happy holidays. And we will chat with you next time. Thanks, Lance. Some of my favorite times are these conversations with you. Take care, bud. I appreciate that. We'll chat soon. All right. Take care. I've had a lot of great conversations over this past year, but that one you just heard is my new number one. Thank you, Mr. Karn, and I look forward to finishing up what we started here today. Well, that concludes another episode of the Hockey Journey Podcast. I can't thank you enough for stopping by and listening. I hope you enjoyed this segment on how to build an elite hockey player. If you think there's someone in your circle of family and friends that might like this episode as well, please share it with just one person. It will really help me in growing this hockey community. Again, I appreciate you being here. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, or submit a review. I hope to see you back here soon. And do me a favor, make someone close to you smile today. All the best, my friends.